Welcome. My name is Alex Johnson, and I'm proud to serve as president of Cuyahoga Community College. We are pleased you are able to join us for this unique presentation as we continue our focus on student success during these challenging times. I am so proud of how responsive the Tri-C community has been to the COVID-19 crisis. In March, we moved thousands of students from in-person classroom to online learning in just two weeks. That is an unprecedented achievement. When we learned that many of our students did not have a computer to complete their online learning, we connected over 600 of those students with laptops and other resources. We launched a full tuition assistance program to offset academic and workforce training costs for Cuyahoga County residents facing financial hardship due to the COVID-19 outbreak. The program covers tuition for new or returning Tri-C students with financial needs that were intensified during the pandemic. We have received many donations to our emergency fund to assist students. The community has really joined together for those working to make a better life for themselves and their families. We are so grateful to our advisory committee members who are providing us insight into the workplace. While we are honoring the excellent work of two committees today, we are also grateful for your work to ensure that Tri-C programs provide the best education possible. Furthermore, we are pleased to honor community members who have contributed to student success and introduce you to some of our outstanding alumni. I am excited now to introduce our keynote speaker, Ms. Grace Gallucci, Executive Director of the Northeast Ohio Area Coordinating Agency, the Metropolitan Planning Authority for Greater Cleveland. They are responsible for transportation planning and resource allocation in a five county region. Ms. Gallucci has many years of experience in communities like Broward County, Florida, Chicago, Illinois, and of course, Cleveland, Ohio. She has lectured at Northwestern University, the University of Illinois at Chicago, Cleveland State University, and Kent State University. Ms. Gallucci is active in a number of professional organizations and has served on several research panels for the Transportation Research Board of the National Academies of Science. She has also been appointed to serve on the U.S. Department of Transportation's Review Advisory Committee for Safety. And now she is with us today to unveil an exciting new prototype in transportation. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Grace Gallucci. Thank you so much, President Johnson. Hello, everyone. I am pleased to be here. Thank you to Claire Rosacco and all of the folks at Tri-C for taking an interest in the work of NOACA and particularly the Hyperloop. For those of you that are not familiar with NOACA, we are the Metropolitan Planning Organization for Greater Cleveland. We cover five counties and a population of 2.1 million folks. Um, because we're talking about the Hyperloop from Cleveland to Chicago, I like to try to put it in perspective of Chicago population. That's about a quarter of the size of population in Chicago. But when you look at our overall Northeast Ohio, which we are the seat of, of Vibrant Neo 2040, uh, that's really close to 4 million and about half the size of Chicago. Uh, NOACA has thought about working on the Hyperloop because we have a vision statement that looks to strengthening regional cohesion, preserving existing infrastructure, and building a sustainable multimodal transportation system. And why? To support economic development and quality of life in Northeast Ohio. 
when we talk about Hyperloop, we're talking about the road to innovation, and that's a pun that is intended. Uh, we are using and thinking about transportation technology, and we've seen a lot of technology over the last few months and what it can do for us. Uh, we're taking those applications of technology and focusing it on transportation, which is to improve the movement of people and goods. And in fact, if you like the presentation today about the Hyperloop, or you just want to know more about transportation and be engaged in the work that we are doing, we are currently developing our long-range plan, which is called E-NEO 2050, the E being for equity. And we are planning 30 years out to the year 2050. And get onto our website, eneo2050.com, uh, and participate in the work that we're doing in terms of input and other kinds of activities to engage um, in the future development of this plan. So what else are we currently developing? Uh, we've got the Hyperloop electric vehicle charging stations, advanced systems management, autonomous vehicles. These are all fantastic things that we are working towards. And we're gonna focus today though on the Hyperloop. What is Hyperloop? Some of you may know uh, the Hyperloop, and essentially it's a new mode of transportation that will revolutionize travel by connecting people and goods with unprecedented speed, safety, and efficiency. Most folks are familiar with the speed because Hyperloop can travel uh, faster than an airplane and faster than um, a train, car, and so we're looking at a um, approximately 760 miles per hour maximum speed. To explain to you a bit more about the uh, mechanics of Hyperloop and the excitement around the technology, I'm gonna give you a few minutes to uh, watch this video. Imagine a capsule. Imagine a capsule that can carry people. Placed inside a depressurized tube, the air removed to eliminate resistance. Not traveling on rails, but actually levitating above them. Capable of reaching airplane speeds and beyond on the ground. This is a Hyperloop, and it is amazing. Even more amazing, at Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, we haven't been imagining it. We've been building it for the better part of five years. And amazing is where we started. We're transforming the passenger experience, putting comfort and safety at the center of everything we're doing. Our reimagined linear electric motor is powered by sustainable solar energy, propelling the capsule on a completely new, incredibly efficient passive levitation system. With these two breakthroughs, our system is capable of giving energy back to the grid. And when something didn't exist, we invented it. Introducing Vibranium a composite material that monitors speed, capsule integrity, and atmospheric condition in real time, a new benchmark in passenger safety. And we're not done. Our team of over 800 strong, a worldwide intellectual ecosystem of thinkers and problem solvers, tackle each day with the humble goal of changing the world. With its speed and efficiency, the Hyperloop will rewrite the rules of travel and mobility. But that's just one side of the story there's another side that will have a far greater impact. It's the side that redefines how we connect with one another. Where distant friends become neighbors, countries become neighborhoods. And everybody who inhabits this big, crazy world of ours grows a little closer together. Just imagine that. Wow, wasn't that exciting? And now that you know a little bit about the technology and the mechanics of the Hyperloop, let's talk specifically about the Great Lakes Hyperloop. Um, NOACA and Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, otherwise known as Hyperloop TT, entered a public-private partnership in February of 2018. And at that time, we announced a feasibility study to look at the potential of Hyperloop between Cleveland and Chicago. It was a $1.2 million study, and we split the cost of that um, $600,000 each in the um, auspices of a true public-private partnership. Um, we did add Pittsburgh to that in June of 2019. So we had a tremendous amount of 
interest from folks in Pittsburgh and added them. Uh, that additional cost was $100,000. And we are glad now to be able to say that these study partners, those that are funding the actual study, include uh, not only NOACA, but the Ohio Department of Transportation, the Ohio Turnpike, the Cleveland Foundation, and the Richard K. Mellon Foundation in Pittsburgh. Um, so these are folks, both the foundations and the public sector, um, and then of course with the private sector, Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. In addition to those partners that are funding the project, we also have collaborators. This is nothing that we can do alone. We are traversing three states and many jurisdictions in between. And so we have partnered with the Illinois Department of Transportation, uh, collaborated with the Indiana Toll Road folks and the INDOT folks, and all of the metropolitan planning organizations along the way from Pittsburgh uh, through to Chicago, including Youngstown, uh, Toledo, Sandusky, and South Bend. We've also partnered with, or we are partnering with the uh, USDOT folks, NASA folks, and many local players as well. The organization, the private company that we've partnered with, Hyperloop TT, um, has many government agreements around the globe. We are the only one, however, in the United States. So then you might ask, with all of these other Hyperloop agreements around the globe, what makes this project so special? Why Cleveland to uh, Chicago? Why the Great Lakes Hyperloop? Well, I think the best way to explain that is for anyone that has actually taken the turnpike driven from Cleveland to Chicago, you may know this, but for those of you that don't know this, when you look at the um, interstate system of the United States, the two largest interstates are Route 80 and Route 90, one going from San Francisco to New York, the other going from Seattle to Boston. Well, they intersect at two places along that route, Cleveland and Chicago. And so between Cleveland and Chicago is a, a toll road operation which suggests several things. It suggests there's a market for uh, transport that people are willing to pay for. It suggests that there is the ability for a public-private partnership to take place as the majority of the development and ultimately the implementation and the operation of a Hyperloop will be private. But we have to have uh, some government um, intervention in the right-of-way and in the planning and the alignment of the um, Hyperloop. So when you look at the fact that that already exists between Cleveland and Chicago, that market, the population, the transport, you think about how we can develop a uh, Hyperloop system that encompasses the Great Lakes, the Midwest, and then ultimately to the East Coast. So think about connecting Chicago to Cleveland to New York. That puts Cleveland right in the center of two of the largest cities in the United States. That really puts us in a unique position for being able to work, live, and play in many parts of the Midwest and East Coast. Um, also, I know that many of you who are from the Cleveland area understand the value of the Great Lakes, uh, but oftentimes um, even the folks that we were pitching this to um, a few years ago didn't understand what the Great Lakes really means. Um, first of all, at USDOT, the United States Department of Transportation, uh, they've identified 12 emerging mega regions across the country. The Great Lakes mega region is the largest of them. And we know that we have 20% of the world's fresh water supply, um, but we also have 30% of the combined US and Canadian workforce. We have 28% of the combined Canadian and US economic activity, 46 million jobs, uh, 20 of the top 100 universities in the country, and then other kinds of augmented um, education and, and colleges, just like right here at Tri-C. Um, the freight also, we actually use the Great Lakes to ship. Um, annually about 200 million tons uh, valued at $232 billion. So the opportunity here is amazing. And in fact, not only is it about transporting, the other thing that makes the Great Lakes region, the Midwest so special, 
um, is the ability to manufacture the Hyperloop. And that's really one of the long-term interests of this from a public perspective is bringing jobs to the region. And I'm gonna play this video for you so you can get a better understanding of our bigger picture that basically takes the transportation and the manufacturing components and sets them in front of us. Dreams come easy. Dreams of time travel, cloning woolly mammoths, and colonizing Pluto. Dreams where we zip across the country in tubes at 700 miles an hour, powered by sunlight and magnets. Five years ago, it was literally just a dream. The problem is, when the time comes for all those dreams to get made, the dreamers don't know where to go. To build dreams, you go to cities unafraid of work and people known for making things. Big things like aviation and smaller things like tanks. The kind of talent that we have at our disposal here is amazing. I have been in transportation and infrastructure for over 30 years. I've been 17 years as a scientist and an executive at NASA. I'm the chairman of the industry-based led Aerospace and Aviation Council. I attended Yale University and started a career in aerospace uh, at McDonnell Douglas. Where do you go to make dreams, to build them with metal and glass in your own two hands? You go to cities like Cleveland and Chicago, Pittsburgh and Detroit, places that have had dreams and then made them. We absolutely have the manufacturing. We have the raw materials. We do it cost effectively. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of work ethic uh, and, and really, really strong resources. The Midwest is a place that drops a welding mask over its face and gets to work. And that's why we can't wait to build America's first Hyperloop here. It is quite amazing to see how many partners Hyperloop Transportation Technology already has with academic institutions, with government institutions, with the private sector. Flying 700 miles an hour through a tube using magnets and sunlight isn't a dream. It's a, we're building this and coming to the Midwest to do it thing. We've already got a prototype thing. Millions in funding to survey it thing. First stop, Cleveland to Chicago in under 30 minutes. Connecting the makers of muscle and metal and rock and brick and mortar of this country. You're going to see Hyperloop transition from what is in the past been perhaps a dream of how fast we can go, how can we send people more quickly to different places. It will eventually become a utility. This is something people will talk about for generations. When your grandkids are uh, telling you about this, this new cool Hyperloop train they got to be on, you can say, you know, I was there when they just started. So let's get to work. This thing can't wait any longer. You know, I've seen that probably a hundred times and I'm inspired each and every time I see it. So now let's get to the feasibility study. Uh, we've just completed the draft feasibility study. We put it out there for public comment and we are just put, putting the finishing touches on its finalized uh, form. So let me tell you a little bit about it. Uh, we had four phases. First phase was putting together the plan, uh, particularly the public engagement plan and the business plan. Second, we did a, a site reconnaissance and preliminary route analysis. Um, essentially what we were looking at was three routes, um, how to get from Cleveland to Chicago. We could go straight through. That unfortunately would take us uh, through Lake Michigan and through Lake Erie. Uh, so although it's the fastest, it's not necessarily the easiest to do. Um, second alternative uh, for the route was going directly along the turnpike, which was sort of my vision when I thought about what this would look like. And um, that works. It does, however, because there are many curves in the state of Indiana mostly, um, slows it down a bit. And then we've got the third, which is sort of a hybrid. It takes the toll road for the um, most practical aspects of it, and then veers off into other kinds of right-of-ways, such as utility or rail, uh, for a portion of it. 
Phase three, technical and financial feasibility, looking at a market analysis, cost benefit analysis, land use, and overall financial analysis. That being a very critical portion of the study because, again, this is intended to be a private venture uh, that is partnering with the public side to ensure that the public interests are covered and advanced. And then uh, phase four was really thinking about how we then move to the uh, next level of study, which gets into the economic impact analysis for the manufacturing and the environmental impact analysis, as well as PE. So what did our feasibility study show? Um, option one, two, and three, um, each one of them is possible, and we can go from 31 minutes direct, uh, 36 minutes with our hybrid option, and 47 along the toll road. Uh, then when you add Pittsburgh on the other side, we can get to Pittsburgh um, anywhere from about 18 to 24 minutes. The overall financial analysis was pretty amazing. Uh, so what we are looking at is employment growth um, over the study period of 900,000 person year jobs, which is phenomenal. And this at this point is not the manufacturing component. The manufacturing component is still to be studied. This is just about the um, impact of the ability to move people and goods uh, with the amount of efficiency and speed uh, that can be done through this corridor. Um, increased income then is $46.7 billion across the corridor. Um, that gives us an expanded tax base of $12.7 billion, and the property value increase is nearly $75 billion along that corridor. Also, from a sustainability perspective, uh, we are looking at reducing emissions, carbon dioxide, by 143 million tons. So you might ask, uh, where does the revenue come from? Um, how is the Hyperloop used? 75% of it is projected to be used uh, by passengers in terms of the revenue uh, generated, and 18% of the revenues generated by the freight business, and 7% the real estate or development. Relative to the passenger market, um, we are looking at Hyperloop obtaining between 25 to 30% of the market. Um, car still being dominant, but again, Hyperloop really starting to cut into that modal share. Um, where do the trips that we will be getting for the Hyperloop come from? Well, the Hyperloop has about 30% induced demand and 50% of it um, diverted from auto, and then the remainder of it diverted from the other modes. From a freight perspective, uh, we are not looking at the Hyperloop for um, the, the, the large sort of tractor trailer kinds of freight, but we are looking more for less than a truckload, cargo, um, express par parcels, and the kind of parcels that typically uh, would be uh, taken through air, air cargo. And why would this be a good thing for the freight industry? Um, basically, the Hyperloop, in terms of the benchmarking cost, can be about 10 cents a mile, which is um, comparable to water or shipping, uh, better than truck and significantly better than air. Not as good or not as inexpensive as rail, but that's okay because we're looking at all modes being complementary to each other with the amount of traffic that will be growing relative to freight. Overall financial analysis, without boring you uh, with all of the, uh, the, the economics that went um, into this analysis, um, essentially taking all of the benefits and the costs, applying the discount rate of both 3% and 7%, which is pretty, pretty, um, pretty strong, uh, we still end up with a cost-benefit ratio that is positive. And therefore, what this means um, is that the private sector would have an incentive to build 
and operate, maintain a Hyperloop because they could generate a profit, which is very different than most of the other kinds of transportation uh, projects that we get involved with. But again, we're not getting involved uh, because we're looking to operate, maintain, or build, but rather um, look out for the public interest on everything from fares to uh, plans for the alternatives, as well as station placements. Uh, think of it almost like an airline mode where maybe government would own the airport, right? So we're looking at owning perhaps the stations or the, uh, the transfer points. And then um, maybe we own the right of way as government and we charge landing fees or lease fees, uh, travel fees. So think of the airline or even a railroad model as kind of what we're, we're thinking of. Um, this project at this point has been around for about two years worth of discussion and we're very proud to have talked to a lot of folks throughout our process. Overall public support has been good. I always point to a very early public support uh, for the Hyperloop. Um, we took a survey uh, with virtual reality at the Cleveland International Film Festival. Um, and we had uh, two thirds of the people say Cleveland to Hyperloop, Cleveland to Chicago Hyperloop is a good idea. Uh, we had 70% say that Cleveland should be one of the first, if not the first, to get this new form of transportation. And nearly 80% said they would ride it if it were available. So um, for those of you that are still skeptical, we understand it is still in the development stages. Um, technology has a long way to go um, in general, um, but we're pretty close. And for those of you that, again, that are still skeptical, I leave you with this last video, um, Once in a Lifetime. Je m'appelle Henriette Ardouin et j'habite à Bagnère de Michaud. Je suis l'une des femmes les plus âgées de France. J'ai peut-être un peu de compétition. Je suis née avant que les hommes se déplacent rapidement. Je me rappelle des premières voitures. J'ai assisté à la disparition du air, le mur du son, l'Américain qui a planté le drapeau sur la lune. Tout ça, je l'ai vécu dans ma vie. On m'a dit qu'il y avait du nouveau bientôt, encore une nouvelle manière de parcourir la Terre. Et on vous embête dans un tube à 1000 km h en lévitation. Et ça marche avec l'énergie solaire. L'avion, à l'époque, aussi, c'était un grand défi. Je me rappelle de mon père. Cet engin ne va jamais décoller du sol. Cette machine, vous l'avez construite, n'est-ce pas C'est quoi son nom, déjà Et puis, le tété. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Tri-C for being a great partner and such a valued part of our community. Thank you to all of you for your attention to this uh, presentation today and for being excited about the Hyperloop along with me and those at NOACA. If you are interested in further engagement on Hyperloop or any of the technology or other transportation projects we are developing, uh, get to our website, e neo2050.com. Uh, we would love to have you part of that development process. Uh, thank you again, and uh, we appreciate uh, being invited to participate in this event today. Thank you, Ms. Gallucci. What an exciting opportunity for our region. We're so grateful to you for your time, and we'll be sending you a token of our appreciation. I've been asked to share with you how the college has been responding to the challenges of COVID-19 as we continue to support our students. 
It's definitely been a long and challenging five months responding and adapting to the challenges of COVID-19. I'm sure many of you can relate as we've all been confronted with the situation none of us could have predicted or prepared for in the short amount of time we were given. But I'm happy to share with you that the college has become stronger, more flexible, safer, and continues to respond to the challenge and deliver the highest quality education and service while keeping our students, faculty, staff, and community safe. We've moved online courses to all but 20% of our coursework with multiple remote options for students. We've streamlined enrollment processes and removed barriers for students. And our offerings of service online include counseling, tutoring, and testing. We've analyzed and adjusted all of our classrooms and service areas to accommodate for social distancing while providing our staff with PPE, instituting improved cleaning measures, and implementing return to campus protocols to keep our campuses safe. I cannot thank our faculty enough for rising to this challenge. And I also thank our dedicated and talented administration and staff for their diligent work to get us to this point. We've come a long way in five months, but we are stronger than ever and prepared for a great fall semester. Now, it's my privilege to introduce our outstanding advisory committees. Cuyahoga Community College occupational programs are required by the Ohio Board of Regents and in some cases, the Ohio Department of Education to create advisory committees. Our advisory committees are an important link for our students to the ever-changing worlds of technology, business, industry, and government practices. Advisory committee members are selected for their specialized knowledge as well as their civic mindedness. Each year, an outstanding advisory committee is selected based upon specific criteria, reviewed by committees, and through recommendations. This year, two exemplary committees have been chosen and we are proud to honor their work. First, the Paralegal Studies Committee. Congratulations to Candace Story, the committee chair and Tri-C program manager, and to the committee. Danita Bray from the Federal Public Defender's Office, Cheryl Bunovic of Tucker Ellis, and West LLP, Marty Chaplin, Cuyahoga Community College faculty member, Deborah Farron from the Office of the United States Attorney, Northern District of Ohio, Joseph Fell, Cuyahoga Community College faculty member, Peggy Foley-Jones from Thrasher, Dinsmore, and Dolan, Jimmy Gonzalez from Cuyahoga Community College, Clayton Harris from Tri-C's Public Safety Center of Excellence, Brian Hoffman, from the Cuyahoga County Public Defender's Office, Donald Junquist from Fund That Flip, Inc., Jean Lavasi, retired and past president of the Parma Area Kiwanis, Frank Osborne, retired partner from Tucker Ellis, LLP, James Plaskanka, Tri-C Public Safety Center of Excellence, and Jeffrey Tuma from Robert L. Tuma and Associates and Cuyahoga Community College faculty member. Thank you all for your excellent work. Next, we are proud to honor the Caption and Court Reporting Advisory Committee. Congratulations to the Chair and Tri-C Program Manager, Kelly Morans, and her committee. Colleen Barnes, Cuyahoga Community College faculty member. Arthur Seferati of the Seferati Group. Carmen Seferati of the Seferati Group. Kathy DiLorenzo from Planet Depot. Kim Falgiani, Captioner, Jimmy Gonzalez of Cuyahoga Community College, Pamela Greenfield from Meller and Hagestrom, Michelle Harper of Molnar Court Reporting, LLC and Tri-C faculty member, Clayton Harris of the Tri-C Public Safety Center of Excellence, Jeff Hunt from the Hunt Reporting Company, Jen Kruger, Cuyahoga Community College faculty member, Nancy Molnar of Molnar Court Reporting, LLC. Lori Moniz, Cuyahoga Community College faculty member. Marguerite Phillips from the Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas. James Plaskanka of the Tri-C Public Safety Center of Excellence. Susan Rafferty, freelance reporter. Patricia Stanton, Cuyahoga Community College faculty member. Stephanie Sweet, captioner. Suzanne Vadnell, 
of the Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas, Tracy Vargo, Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas, Laura Ware from Ware Reporting, and Darlene Williams of Planet Depot. Congratulations to all of our honorees and for all of our dedicated advisory committees. Thank you for your commitment to Tri-C and to student success here at the college. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Clara Zacco, Vice President of Government Relations and Community Outreach. Thank you. Congratulations to our paralegal studies and captioning and court reporting advisory committees. We are so grateful to you for all of your good work. We would now like to introduce you to our fifth annual Community Champion Award winners. These companies and individuals go above and beyond to support student success at Cuyahoga Community College. Once again, we received a number of excellent nominations and today we honor our 2020 Community Champions. We begin with KeyBank, our corporate community champion in the category of a business with over 500 employees. Since 1993, KeyBank has contributed over $5.6 million to the college in 2016. The KeyBank Foundation committed $1.4 million to establish the KeyBank Public Safety Training Center of Excellence on the Western Campus and the KeyBank Public Safety Scholarship, which provides women and underrepresented minorities the opportunity to pursue public safety careers. This gift has helped to position the college as a leader in training first responders for the in-demand jobs that keep our communities safe. In addition, over 1,000 students have received KeyBank Scholarship Awards from the KeyBank Hispanic Scholarship Fund and the KeyBank Business Endowed Scholarship. Since 2015, KeyBank has been the presenting sponsor for Tri-C Jazz Fest, and they supported this year's move to an online format, assisting in the design of creative new ways to recognize sponsors and virtually promote the event. A $1 million KeyBank grant launched Career Place in 2001, which transformed Tri-C's assistance and resources for student job seekers. The center annually serves about 10,000 students. Tri-C leadership benefits from the service and expertise of KeyBank executives. Trina Evans, Executive Vice President and Director of its Corporate Center, is a member of the Tri-C Foundation Board of Directors and past chairperson. Don Graves, Head of Corporate Responsibility and Community Relations, and Margot Copeland, retired KeyBank Foundation CEO, are members of the Tri-C Board of Visitors, and retired executive Bruce Murphy served on the Tri-C Board of Trustees from 2007 to 2012. On behalf of the students, faculty, and staff of Cuyahoga Community College, we thank KeyBank for their many contributions to student success. And now we honor our community champion business with less than 50 employees, Strassman Insurance Services, under the leadership of President and CEO Jim Strassman. Strassman Insurance Services has been an enthusiastic supporter of the annual Tri-C Jazz Fest for over a decade, giving their gift directly to the Creative Arts Scholarship Fund so that students may have the opportunity to pursue their dreams with a high quality education. While the COVID-19 crisis has forced the Tri-C Jazz Fest into a virtual format, Strassman Insurance Services continued their support and sponsorship of this year's festival with renewed excitement as the festival highlighted the immense wealth of Jazz Fest talent that calls Cleveland home. Jim Strassman has also been a devoted member of the Tri-C Foundation Board of Directors since 2001 actively supporting the mission and vision of Cuyahoga Community College. Strassman Insurance Services has served the region with a personal touch, gaining the trust of a variety of businesses. We are grateful for their leadership in supporting students at Tri-C. And our final community champion is Mr. Gregory Jones. Mr. Jones, or Pop, as he is affectionately known by his mentees, is a humble, dedicated community servant who demonstrates the best of character, leadership, and a sense of caring and responsibility for Tri-C students who are aging out of the foster care system. 
young people who are in need of housing and facing other challenges. In his career as a program officer with the Cuyahoga County Department of Children and Family Services Permanency Support Unit, Mr. Jones works daily to ensure young people make a successful transition from foster care to adulthood. He has established a Tri-C partnership which connects those young people to educational and workforce training resources. He has founded a nonprofit called A Second Home for You, which supplies a home and safe haven for young men as they journey to becoming independent and successful adults. Congratulations to Gregory Jones, who embodies the spirit of a true community champion. We at Cuyahoga Community College are so very grateful to these wonderful community champions. Each organization and Mr. Jones will receive a special award recognizing their contributions. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Megan O'Brien, Vice President of Development at Tri-C, who will present our alumni awards. Thank you. Greetings. It's my pleasure to present our third annual alumni awards. The Distinguished Alumni Award is presented to a Tri-C graduate who has established themselves as an accomplished professional, demonstrating notable achievements and or college and community service, having earned a Tri-C degree more than 10 years ago. The Alumni Rising Star Award is awarded to those who have completed their Tri-C degree within the past 10 years. We're so happy to introduce to you a distinguished alumni and two rising stars. Our Distinguished Alumni Award winner is Harold Anderson, who received his Associate of Arts degree in 1983 and went on to earn a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas, along with a commission in the United States Army Reserve Officers Training Corps. Mr. Anderson served in the United States Army Reserve for 30 years and holds the rank of Colonel. During his service, he was deployed to Iraq and Kuwait in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom. Mr. Anderson has also participated in three mobilization assignments at the Pentagon and in Indianapolis and Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Mr. Anderson is a full-time educator for the East Cleveland City Schools. In 2018, he founded and chaired the City of Cleveland's first urban oratorical and debate competition through the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Thurgood Marshall Oratorical Debate Competition. In 2020, he created the first urban student forum for over 250 middle and high school students. Mr. Anderson currently serves on the advisory councils at the Lewis Stokes Veteran Hospital and New Tech East High School and serves on the boards of directors at Lake Erie College in Painesville, Ohio. We are so proud that his future began at Cuyahoga Community College and congratulate him on his ongoing success in making a difference in our world. And now we would like to introduce you to the first of our two Rising Star alumni, Lawrence Heller. Mr. Heller is a 2013 graduate of Cuyahoga Community College and later Cleveland State University. He works as an addiction counselor at Northern Ohio Recovery Association, also known as NORA, providing individual and group counseling and case management services. He is an active community volunteer, distributing meals to homeless and those who are hungry every weekend. Last winter, he personally distributed over 1,000 coats. He serves on the Mental Health Advisory Committee of the Cuyahoga County Opioid Task Force and is active with Greater Cleveland Congregations. At Tri-C, Mr. Heller helped establish the campus food pantries. Tri-C helped him to overcome many barriers and truly create a new future for himself, discovering his personal mission to help others. During the COVID-19 crisis, Mr. Heller is responding to emerging needs, including homelessness and hunger. He coordinates and assists in food distribution. Having been trained in telehealth, he assisted NORA groups in transitioning to telehealth services. 
we congratulate Mr. Heller on overcoming obstacles to become a true rising star in our community. Our final rising star is Jamal Julia Lello Budiab. Ms. Budiab earned an Associate of Applied Business degree in 2013. She is currently a licensed real estate agent and operations manager at B2B Realty, where she leads the property management department. Born and raised in Lebanon, Ms. Budiab immigrated to the United States with her family in 2006. She enrolled at Tri-C after graduating from Lincoln West High School and is a founding member of Masra Cleveland Al-Arabi, a Cleveland public theater program by and for Arabic-speaking communities. She has also been a cast member in several of its productions. She was a member of the Ajayal Dabaki Lebanese Dance Group and performed in festivals around the region. She is part of the leadership board of the newly created Arab Americans of Cleveland Young Professionals Network. Her message is a universal one. We must support one another and help where we can bring each other up. Powerful words for our time. Congratulations to our distinguished alumni, rising stars, and all who have been honored today. We are so grateful to be associated with so many accomplished people. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you soon.